What's up guys, we're back with another educational video and this week we are talking about energy deficiency. What the hell? We're talking about crash dieting. But first, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment for the algorithm. A new study just got published uh, out of Denmark and honestly, it's pretty cool. So this study was looking at whether or not a short-term, low-calorie diet negatively impacted anabolism and basically what they called symptoms of energy deficiency versus basically a diet at maintenance. And so for this, they were looking at female subjects. Now what was cool about this study is it wasn't very long in duration. It was only 10 days in terms of the experimental length, but it was very, very, very highly controlled and they looked at a lot of different markers. We're not gonna discuss all of them, but we are gonna discuss the most relevant ones. Now, many people will hear 10 days and they'll go, what a trash study. Please keep in mind, guys, if you're doing human control trials, you're measuring a lot of stuff and you're controlling a lot of variables, you're not gonna be able to do it for very long, especially when you consider that many of the subjects in these studies are college students. Good luck getting them to stick to something for a very long period of time and also being able to poke and prod them. And in this study, they were doing a lot of time intensive and invasive measures. So for example, they were looking at resting energy expenditure. They were taking blood draws. They were collecting urine for different things and they were taking muscle biopsies. So they're literally taking a chunk of their thigh out. With these sorts of studies, you just can't do them for that long because frankly, nobody would do the study. In this study, they used female subjects who were healthy. And what was really cool was they randomized them into the group in pairs based on their training experience. Now this is important because if you collect just a group of subjects, many of them will have different training ages and experiences, and you could call them all trained, but a trained person could be very different from somebody who's been lifting for a year versus somebody who's been lifting for 10 years. The other thing they did was they didn't start the experiment until a certain phase of their menstrual cycles. So they made sure that they all were lined up in terms of their menstrual cycle. Now they weren't all coming in at the same times, but for example, day one for somebody might have started on say the 15th of a month and day one for somebody else might have started on the 22nd, you know, based on when their menstrual cycle was lined up. So I thought that was also very cool. So they were taking out the possibility that the stage of the menstrual cycle could have some impact, which is very important since it was such a short study because if there's water retention or anything like that, that can impact their fat-free mass. Also, they made sure that all of them were healthy, had regular periods, and that none of them had taken oral contraceptives within the last few months. What was the actual treatment itself? Well, one, they had both groups train really hard. So they had them on a very intensive uh, upper-lower split, and they also had them doing hard cardiovascular exercise. Now, what's cool is they had them both on run-in diets for six days, where they were getting about 23 to 2400 calories per day. Their protein was about 100 grams on average. Carbohydrate was around 300 grams and fat was around 80 grams. So it was about 23, 2400 calories. Now they made sure that they had enough protein and they put them on 2.2 grams of protein per kilogram of fat-free mass. Now they said they did this because of differences in body fat. And I thought this was really important because a lot of people miss this. Protein requirements, while they're given typically as per kilo of body weight, in reality, you would be more accurate doing per kilo of fat-free mass or lean mass because fat mass doesn't really have a protein requirement and if it does, it's very, very low. And so in strange circumstances, you can get people who are like overweight or obese who would be on like 400 grams of protein a day if you did it per kilo of body weight. So it's just more accurate to do it with fat-free mass. And again, this study paid a lot of attention to detail. It really did a great job of picking out markers to analyze that were relevant to the question that they wanted to ask, which was, does low energy impair anabolism? 
and performance. They had them on these run-in diets and then they either kept the one group on the run-in diet, so basically kept the macros the same. The other group they put on the low energy diet, which equated to about 100 grams of protein a day, about 145 grams of carbohydrate, and about 40 grams of fat. So basically, they got their carbs and fats cut in half, essentially. Uh, and then they looked at what happened over the next 10 days. What did they find? First off, they found that the group that kind of just maintained their calories didn't have a change in body weight, but did gain some lean mass and did lose some body fat. So kind of a recompositioning effect. The other group lost body fat, but also lost lean mass. They lost 1.7 kilos of body weight, of which 0.4 kilos was lean mass. Now it's important to point out that lean mass isn't necessarily contractile tissue. A lot of it is body water. Uh, you can lose lean mass from other tissues, but in order to do further analysis, they measured the rate of muscle protein synthesis in both groups and found that in the group that was on the low energy diet, their rates of muscle protein synthesis were significantly lower on the low calorie diet than they were on the kind of maintenance diet. Now this is important because a lot of people say, well, if you're getting enough protein, it's gonna keep protein synthesis high enough. Not necessarily, not when calories get too low. Calories are protein sparing and they're also good for protein synthesis. And this kind of once again points out the fact that if you're in an energy deficit, it's harder to build muscle. So they also went even further and looked at protein synthesis signaling, which is part of the mTOR pathway. And they found things like the stimulation of P70S6 kinase, which is a signaling protein that is uh, stimulated when protein synthesis increases was significantly greater in the energy available group versus the non-energy available group or low energy availability group. And so even though it's short and even though lean mass loss can be some from fluid, you're starting to paint a picture that at minimum you're having disruptions in the signaling aspect of protein synthesis, which may very likely lead to less lean mass. Now I want to point out that about 25% of the weight they lost was from lean mass. That is not that much different than a lot of the other studies out there. They didn't do a group that was getting, say, kind of an in-between number, which would have been nice to see, but obviously the problem is it would have cut down on the subjects per group, and they wanted to basically just compare these two groups. So we kind of have to have conjecture to say, what if they'd been in a slight calorie deficit or a moderate calorie deficit? We don't really know because they didn't compare those. And it's not a criticism of the study. I'm surprised they were able to recruit as many subjects as they did, to be honest. Now, when it came to things like looking at metabolism, they did find a slowing of metabolism in the low energy group by about 65 calories per day after this 10 day period. It's possible that that would have just plateaued and not continued to go down more. Again, we don't know. Uh, the group that was on the maintenance calories had no change in their metabolic rate. The group that was on the low calories did in fact have a significant decrease in levels of thyroid hormone as well. And while most of the things they measured like insulin, glucose, cortisol, didn't really significantly change from group to group, the one thing that did change was there was a shift and an increase in the ratio of cortisol to insulin in the low calorie group. What are my take homes from all this? Well, I think the first take home I have is that if your goal is to build muscle, you are going to be much better able to do that at maintenance or in a slight surplus than you are in a deficit. There's quite clear evidence now in my mind that being in a deficit is going to impair your ability to accrue lean mass. And in fact, in this study, we saw them lose lean mass even though they were training really hard. The second thing I really take away from this is that hard training is pretty amazing because one, I'm surprised they didn't lose a greater percentage of lean mass because when you look in studies where they do really aggressive dieting like this, a lot of times you can see up to a 50% loss of lean mass of the weight they lose. But in this study, they lost only 25%, which I think is actually pretty impressive considering the severity of the energy deficit and how much exercise they were doing. They would have been 
very energy deprived. And if you look at the group that was on maintenance, they lost fat and gained lean mass over a 10 day period. Now, again, lean mass can be fluid. So it's hard to say if there would be a difference in contractile tissue over time, but based on the rates of myofibrillar protein synthesis, it looks like it was certainly pointed that direction. A lot of people will take this and say, well, just eat it maintenance. You don't need a calorie surplus because you can build muscle and lose fat at maintenance. You, you can, but I think the real takeaway is this was a very, very demanding resistance training program, probably more so than these women were used to. And I think that is what is driving that recomposition effect. When I began lifting, I was about 140 pounds and about, at least on calipers, about 8% body fat. Right now, I'm about 210 pounds and similar body fat on calipers, maybe slightly more, maybe like 8.5% on calipers. No, I'm not actually saying I'm 8.5% before all of you body fat Nazis jump on me and tell me that I'm 10 or 12 or whatever. I'm just saying that based on the same measurement or similar measurement, I am a similar body fat now as when I started and I have 70 pounds more body weight. Does anyone truly believe that I could simply have recomped my way here? I certainly don't. Maybe you do, but I don't. In fact, if you're at maintenance calories, it's going to be really hard to continue to add lean mass if you're not gaining any body weight whatsoever. I think this study was super cool. I really appreciated how into depth the researchers went. And I appreciated that the question they wanted to answer, which is, does low energy impact the ability to build muscle and body composition? They used very appropriate measurements in order to assess the answer to that question. And the answer right now, at least with maintenance compared to a pretty severe energy deficit, is that yes, an energy deficit does impair the accrual of lean tissue and in fact can cause loss of lean tissue even when training very hard and even when consuming enough protein. What's my takeaway from this? Well, my takeaway from this truly is one, being able to push yourself and train hard is so important. Again, there was so much attention paid to the details in the study. They even standardized range of motion on the different exercises that they were doing just to make sure that these people were training hard enough and training appropriately. Your most powerful tool for changing your body composition is not your nutrition. Your most powerful tool is resistance training. Really, really hard resistance training. Many people out there worry about overtraining. The reality is, is that most of you should be worried about undertraining. Most of you are undertraining. And when we look at the scientific research, we see that people underestimate what they think is a hard set by about five reps. If they do say eight reps and are asked to rate the set and they say, oh, it was two reps away from failure. When the researchers pushed them to absolute failure, those same subjects ended up getting about 15 reps, meaning they did five more reps than they thought they could. Most people stop when it gets hard. In reality, if you want to build muscle, if you want to build an impressive physique, you are going to have to learn how to tolerate discomfort and pain. In fact, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was at my first bodybuilding show. I asked the natural world champ at the time, Dave Gooden, most successful natural bodybuilder in history up to that point, how to grow my legs because I had very skinny legs. And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, if you're gonna stay natural and you want to grow your legs and they're a weak point, you better learn how to tolerate some pain. And I made that my mantra. Now, I don't have the best legs in the world and I'll never have the best legs when I competed on stage, but after 10 years of really hammering my legs very, very hard and enduring a lot of pain, I had a pretty good set of legs and even went on to set a squat world record in 2015 of 668 pounds at 201.5 pounds body weight. If you want to change your body composition, learn how to push yourself. And if you need help setting up a training program, make sure you click the link to the BioLane Workout Builder because we can take all the guesswork out of the sets, reps, intensity, while still giving you the freedom to choose exercises that you prefer. 
And if you sign up for the Workout Builder, you can add reps, our research review, for just a few dollars more per month. So now, not only are you getting your training covered, but you're educating yourself on what is legit and what is BS in the realm of scientific studies. So links for both those are in the description. Hope you guys enjoyed the video and I'll catch you next week.